Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode on Tuk Tok Podcast. I am Dr. Gil. Uh, thank you so much for joining to Tuk Tok to Podcast live uh, into at the London School of Economics with Professor uh, Cairo. Tuk Tok Podcast is a discussion of culture, history, politics, and current affairs of Tibet and China in international politics. It's my honor to invite uh, Professor Carlos. He's a professor and chair of the Department of Anthropology at uh, University of Colorado, USA, and a scholar of contemporary uh, Tibet and Himalayas, author of Arrested History, Tibet, the CIA, and the Memories of uh, Forgotten uh, Wars of the Tibet and the uh, and uh, Tibet related uh, articles, essays, books, and she is also working on, on like upcoming uh, many books related to Tibet and other scholarships. Uh, welcome to Tuk Tok Podcast. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you for having me. Uh, let's uh, start with like uh, how you get like interest in Tibet and mm -hmm. uh, when you start studying like the more focus on Tibetan studies. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Um, this is actually one of the number one questions I'm asked. Uh, yeah. is that this is a, so I, I have an answer for it and it's somewhat long because I'm going to give you the whole story. So when I was a university student, I wanted to study abroad, which is something very common in the United States, and students go and do uh, one semester or one year in another country. And many students from my university came here to London or went to Paris, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to go someplace else. And I uh, found a catalog for a, a school that had programs around the world, not just in Europe, but in other places. And I opened up the catalog to the page on Nepal. And the first sentence said, Nepal is a country of superlatives. And it said, like, from sea level to the top of Mount Everest, you know, over 40 languages in one country, you know, some multiple religions, like, different climate, everything. And I read it and thought, this is where, like, I've always wanted to go here, but I didn't know. Right, until I read that. And I called my parents and I said, I'd like to study abroad in Nepal. And they said, where is that? And I said, I don't know, but I want to go there. And they let me go. And at the time, I knew nothing. The Himalayas, Nepal, Tibet, nothing. When I got to Nepal, so I was 20 years old when I went. It was my first time leaving the United States. Um, the teachers we had took us up to, um, very close to the border of Tibet, um, to uh, south part of Mustang. So we were in a village called Marpa, which is right near Jomsom, uh, Mutanaf, Kagbeni, that area. And in the village where we stayed, there was a Tibetan refugee camp just a 10 minute walk south of the village called Serok. And this was on a trekking route, it's the Annapurnas. And a trekking route is a place where you know, people are trekking going around this massive mountain range and spending just one night in each village. But we were a group of American students and we stayed for two weeks. So we became a tourist attraction, right? Because it was so unusual for these foreigners to be staying and not continuing on the next day. And we were learning to speak Nepali. So every day we could speak more and more Nepali, right? To talk with the local people. And men and women from the Cerro Tibetan camp would come every day to to see what we were up to, to talk with us, you know, to just sit down, have tea, have biscuits. And what they told me changed my life. All right, so this was at a time in the world when the story of Tibet, no one knew what it was. You know, like I was the sort of college student, university student, like I would have known. So like now when I step into the classroom, I can presume that my American university students, they know that something happened in Tibet, that there's some sort of issue associated with Tibet. They might not know all the details about it, but they know there's something. When I was in college, when, when I was in university, that wasn't the case. Like the free Tibet movement hadn't emerged yet as an international or global movement. So I knew nothing at all. And what they told me, like I said, changed my life. So this was 1989, it was 30 years after Tibetans had escaped in 1959, right? So exactly 30 years. And they told me they had lost their country. They had fled on foot right, over the Himalayas, in, you know, the world's tallest mountain range, right, into India and Nepal, and had left behind their parents, right, their grandparents, right, aunties, uncles, friends, you know, their animals. 
and that for a 30 year period, they had no way of being in touch with these people. At the time, I mean, there were no, there were no cell phones, there were no mobile phones, um, but there was also no way, uh, you couldn't make a phone call on a landline, that didn't exist. You also couldn't send a letter. So there was no way to just write a letter by hand and mail it. People were also not coming back and forth, so you couldn't even get oral news, right? Say so someone from your village escaped and could, and could share with you that your family was okay. So they literally knew nothing. They didn't know if their families, friends, you know, were alive or what their story was or what had happened to them in 30 years. And I sat there and thought, oh my goodness, I didn't know that was possible. Right? that you could lose your country, that you would be separated from your family and live for 30 years not knowing if they were still alive. And I thought, you know, back in Kathmandu, there was a plane ticket with my name on it. And at the time, there was one place in all of Kathmandu where you could make an international phone call, but I could go there and I could pay, you know, so many rupees and I could call home if I wanted to, right? And the fact that there were people who couldn't do that made a huge impression on me. So I wanted to know why. Right? What happened? How did the Tibetans lose their country? Um, and why did I not know this? Why did the world not know this? And I wanted to tell people about it. And so I went back to my university in the United States and every single paper I wrote for the rest of my college career was about Tibet. My professors must have been very, like, I don't know, annoyed or amused by me. Um, after I graduated from university, I got a scholarship to go and do independent research for one year in Nepal, but also to go to Tibet. And so I was learning to speak Tibetan. Um, after that, I volunteered um, in Washington, D.C. with ICT, the International Campaign for Tibet, which was at that time, this was before SFT, Students for Free Tibet, existed in the world. It hadn't been created yet. So in the U.S., ICT was the Center for Activism. And so I went um, and became a kind of a young activist activist scholar and worked with um, a wonderful man, uh, Gyari Rinpoche, so who some people listening might know, who at the time was the Dalai Lama's special envoy. And he was the person who was leading all of the Tibetan delegations to China for negotiations with the PRC. Um, and he took me under his wing. So he was a politician who understood the importance of partnering with scholars. And so right from the very beginning of my career, like my first teachers were those Tibetans in that camp, right? And then um, Gary Rinpoche in DC, like my anthropology professors were in there too and, and very important, but my very first teachers and not just for language, right? For understanding history and politics as well as culture, right? Um, yeah. Was a Tibetan community. So today we are going to discuss more on the uh, like Professor Carlos book, the LSU history. Uh, like this book is more focused on the Chushikong to right? the four mm -hmm. four rivers and five ranges, uh, six ranges, right? So before we go back, uh, before we go into the deep of the dis argument and discussions, can you give like the background, like the historical events and the, the like significance of the that era? Okay. Sure. So, so this this book is is very specifically about uh, the eastern province of Tibet, uh, which is called Kham. And so, one of the things that Gary Rinpoche said to me when I went to graduate school is, "Carol, we need someone to write a history of Tibet from Kham." So, at the time, all histories of Tibet were focused on the capital, on Lhasa. Right, in the same way that histories of you know, England are centered on London, histories of the United States are centered on you know, Washington, D.C. Right? But at the t what happens when you go out to the margins right, and go out to the frontiers, to the regions, right, and, and leave the center? What story of a country do you tell from a different location? And because Kham is the easternmost province, it's the border with China. So the people of Kham had the longest experience dealing with China. So this is what I wanted to know, right? So even coming to write this book to work with Chushi Gandru had to first start with just going uh, to people from Kham, called Kampos, right? And to ask them, right, what does it mean to be Kampa? What does it mean to position yourself in that way, be positioned vis-a-vis -vis the state? Um, and one of the things they told me, two things they told me right from the very beginning, is that the Kampas were the fighters, that they were the ones who historically had to defend Tibet against China, in some ways because of their location, but in another way is because that was who they are, right? And that's also a stereotype of people from this area, that they're the fighters, right, of Tibet. 
Um, but also, um, something else they said to me, and specifically a man named Nyaro Atten, um, changed also what I was doing. So I had started graduate school, uh, a PhD in anthropology. And after my first year, I went to Kathmandu and was doing preliminary research. And he said to me, if you want to ask questions about culture, identity, and politics, we have to talk about history. It's like, you have to pay attention to history. So I went back to the University of Michigan where I was a student, and that's when I enrolled. I switched from just doing a PhD in anthropology to a PhD in anthropology and history, so that I would get theoretical, methodological, right, disciplinary training in both of, the, both of those fields. Um, so as I started doing my research, one of the things that just immediately caught my attention was the Tibetan army Chushigandru. So um, as Drukhtar just said, that name uh, means four rivers, six ranges. So it's, it's an ancient name for Kham for this region that references the four rivers that kind of cut through, going north to south, and the six mountain ranges. And this was a name that was actually given to the army by Ling Rinpoche, by one of the Dalai Lama's tutors, uh, who himself was Kampa, but as a, an auspicious name for, for the army to have. And I was interested in this in, in many ways. Um, one, because it was a Kampa history, so this was doing that decentering work that I had asked, been asked to do, right, by Gary Rinpoche. But also, it was the 90s. And, um, you know, for, for the scholars listening to this, if we look back, you know, if you look at each decade in the discipline of anthropology or the discipline of history, think, okay, what was going on at that time, right? What were the conversations? What were we talking about? And the 90s was all about, in some ways, subaltern studies, post structuralism. So it was about looking at non elite histories. It was about decentering right um, the privilege the national um, you know the decentering Lhasa for example and it was about looking at stories that hadn't yet been told this story I would argue and, and this is the title right was not told was not known but it also had a connection to my country right because of the CIA and the only way the story had been told was as if it was a CIA story which is an incorrect, you know, like a partial, a very partial way to tell this story because the story of Chushigandru is really a Tibetan story, right? That predates and pre-exists the CIA interest in or involvement with the army. Yeah, it's very interesting. The Chushigandru, they have like the structure organization, there's a declaration and all these things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, can you give like more background about like what is exactly the Chushigandru? Okay. All right, so a little more quick history. Right? <laughs> uh, 1947 is when um, Indians, can, can I say this in London, kick the British out. Um, right, so quit India, right? So um, India reverts to an independent country, where it is no longer a colony of British Empire. Two years later in China is when Mao Zedong's communist PLA, People's Liberation Army, defeats Chiang Kai-shek's Republican Army. Right, so in a two-year span we have an independent India and all of a sudden we have a communist China. One of the very first things that Mao says he wants to do is liberate Tibet and he says he wants to liberate Tibet from feudalism and also from uh, imperialists. There were two British men in Tibet at the time, right? So it wasn't really as if Tibet was some sort of imperialist hotbed, um, and they were both radio operators. So that was a bit of a farce. However, uh, he was true to his word. Um, because he invaded Tibet and he did it right around the same time that the Korean War started. So it was very much a bait and switch sort of thing where the world's attention was focused on Korea. Um, Mao moved into Tibet. So first went into Kham, so this eastern area, also to Amdo, the northeastern province of Tibet. By 1950, they had crossed the Drichu, which is the main river, um, one of the main rivers of Tibet and then eventually made their way to Lhasa, to the capital in central Tibet. By 1951, the Chinese had forced the Tibetans um, to sign what's called the 17-point agreement. Right, so the 17-point agreement in 1951 basically ends up putting um, 
Tibet, Tibetan government, the Tibetan people somewhat uh, under China um, in a framework that's said to be you know, cooperative and where there's some autonomy. Uh, the Tibetan government said that it had been signed under duress, right? So a forced signature and a stamp that actually had been crafted in the moment that wasn't a, an authentic stamp. And so they um, rejected this after initially trying to make things work. All right. It's a long history, right? Um, and the same thing, like initially when the PLA, the actual soldiers, went to the different villages, they were very kind. They had instructions to be nice to the Tibetans. They would come in with bags of silver coins, right? And they would hand out these silver coins. Actually, I talk about this in the book, right? Like there's a saying um, that translates in English, the Chinese are like kind parents. The silver dollars rain down on us, right? Because they were just going around basically like buying people by giving them money. Uh, then everything changed, <laughs> and it started changing around 1956. And then at this time, this is when people use the phrase um, turned upside down, that all of a sudden society was turned upside down. So the heads of society, whether they were monks, um, whether they were chieftains, whether they were kings or queens, and the different basically counties or payu of um, Kham were organized differently. Some had chieftains as their heads, some had monastic religious leaders, and some were monarchies. Right? So it was a really different patchwork of political and social organization. Those historic, her hereditary, and traditional leaders um, were made to be castigated. Ordinary people, beggars, were lifted up and, and became the leaders. You know, the Chinese instituted them as the leaders. Really, like literally turned upside down. Um, at the same time, then abuses started. Um, people were forced um, to verbally abuse and to physically abuse in public their leaders uh, through uh, Tamsing practices. Um, the cover of this book uh, shows some of this period. It shows planes flying overhead monasteries, bombing the monasteries, which is actually how the book starts with the bombing of the monasteries. It shows um, Chinese soldiers pulling down statues of the Buddha. Right here, an image of scripture burning. Um, a Chinese soldier here chasing at gunpoint a Tibetan monk. And this actually, the cover image, this was drawn by one of the Tibetan soldiers. Right, so in, in the army. So as this happened, right, as the pillars of society in terms of both institutions and also the leaders were attacked, the people decided to start fighting back, right? Both men and women, just ordinary people, farmers, nomads, carpenters, teachers, you know, pastoralists, whoever, it didn't matter who you were, um, started to fight back and you just fought back from where you were. First, your neighborhood, right, your village, then joining with the other villages in your district. Um, then eventually, as things got worse, as more Chinese soldiers were coming, the different districts, or the different Paiyu, right, in Tibetan, started coordinating, right? So they would send from Litong, send a letter to Dege, to Nyarong, to Darsendo, to Chating, uh, you know, on the fifth day of the seventh month. Let's all attack on this day. So then they started coordinated efforts to fight. And then this continued for a while, loosely under the name of Tenzin Danglongmar, which is basically just like army to defend Buddhism, right? To defend the Dharma. As things, I'm, then, I'm making this very quick, it seems long, this is like a very quick version of the history. As things continued to deteriorate because the Tibetans had very old uh, rifles, basically, that they had gotten from British India and they had knives. The Chinese had airplanes. Right? They had machine guns, they had modern weapons, and the Tibetans had very antiquated ones. There was also a vast discrepancy in the scale of the armies. You know, Tibetans had men and women in the thousands, China had them in the millions, like, and they just kept coming. So the Tibetans eventually had to escape, go west to Lhasa, and it was in Lhasa that they then decided to create a formal army. Right? And to create not just a, a loose informal army, but to come together as a formal army. That's when they petitioned the, one of the Dalai Lama's tutors for a name. They received the name Chushigandru. They collected money um, from all of the members of the army, as well as from the main traders of Amdo of Kham, all of the wealthy families, a number of central Tibetan families as well. And they created a golden throne in gem encrusted throne for the Dalai Lama. They offered this throne to him along with a long life serving ceremony for his holiness as kind of the consecration of the army.
right, so it was June 16th, 1958, that the Army was formally created. And at that moment, because it was an army dedicated to the Dalai Lama, women stopped fighting in it. It was considered culturally inappropriate for reasons of pollution for women to be in the army at that point. So their role then shifted. And at that time it became an army of just men, right, versus the entire community fighting. All right, that was a lot. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it continues, but there's yeah. how things got started. And like, uh, when we talk about the Jishi Kantu, like, the most like successful part of the Jishi Kantu is like, the Jishi Kantu armies, they helped to escape the Dalai Lama, right? right? And they started. Can you talk about like, the initial relationship between like, the Tibetan government and the Jishi Kantu in the initial stage? Okay. So as you can imagine, the Chinese were not very happy with Chushigandru, right? That, that, it, that it came into being, that it existed at all, um, because there was a Tibetan army. So there was an official Tibetan government army that was um, quite small, and it was not fighting back against the Chinese. And the two armies did not formally join. A couple men um, defected from the Tibetan army to join with Chushigandru. But the Tibetan government was in a very difficult place, right? This was at a time in the 1950s where they were still there was still hope. They were still hoping in some ways that the autonomy that the Chinese Communist Party had promised them would manifest, would become true. And they were also trying to protect right, everything in Lhasa. Um, so they were trying to negotiate, cooperate, to see if there was a path forward at the same time that they were entirely suspicious and not trusting of the Chinese. And the Tibetan aristocrats who controlled the government um, were also in that same position. Many of them were trying to defend their position, their wealth, their families, right, their name, by cooperating in some way with the Chinese. So the relationship with the Tibetan government had to be one that was very secret. Right? It was the sort of thing where like in a back room or a hallway, you know, like the equivalent of the prime minister would say to the Chushigandru general, like to Andrew Gompotashi, the leader of, of Chushigandru, you know, if you go to the Tibetan govern government armory, right, in this town, or to the zone, you know, here's the password basically to say to the head abbot um, so that you can go in and collect all of, of the arms and the ammunition that's stored in the fort. Right. We can't officially let you do it, but wink, wink, right? here's how to get in there and get those arms so that the army can have them. Right? So all of that had to be done, um, you know, not just under the radar, but entirely secretly. And that remains a point of tension also, right? that the Tibetan government couldn't publicly support Chushigandru. Shushigandru, however, publicly supported the government. And so we just had March 10th, right, the um, commemoration of Tibetan Uprising Day, uh, which is a commemoration, you know, of the Tibetan public civilian defense of the Dalai Lama um, in fear of a kidnapping attempt, right, by the, by the Chinese. So his holiness dresses as a civilian, right, manages to escape Lhasa on a horse, and it's the Chushigandru soldiers, right, who escort him safely from Lhasa into India. Uh, two of the soldiers on that were trained telegraph operators who had been trained by the CIA, and so they were radio, radio, radioing, radioing, excuse me, out his holiness's status and position, right, to CIA operatives um, actually back in Virginia who are receiving this, like just outside of Washington, D.C., receiving the news. So the world did not know, right? It wasn't announced to the world that the Dalai Lama was trying to escape, right? It was kept entirely secret. Um, China didn't, probably both knew and didn't know what was going on. We don't fully know that entirely. Um, but it was Chushigandru those two telegraph operators and then a um, battalion of bodyguards, right, who made it possible for him to escape. Um, so the Tibetan scholar and writer Jamyong Norbu has stated that it, if it wasn't for Chushigandru, right, the Tibetan exile community would not exist, right? The exile government wouldn't have been able to come into formation um, because His Holiness would have got stuck, right, in Tibet and probably kidnapped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your book, the title is Arrested History, mm -hmm. right? Tibet CI and the Memories of Forgotten, uh, forgotten Wars. History and as an anthropologist, like why you feel that this is very significant mm -hmm. and why and how the uh, the Chishikantuk's history arrested 
-hmm. It took me a long time to, to figure out what to call this practice. So a lot of um, a lot of the people with whom I spoke described this practice of historical production, but it didn't have a name. And so what I mean by historical production, I'm taking a term from Michel Rove Trio there, um, just the anthropolo Haitian anthropologist, is the question of what becomes history, right? So what happenings, what events are historicized, and what aren't given that category? Right? What are granted the status of history? And what happens right, to, to those experiences you have, the knowledge you have, the memories you have? So for example, for those bodyguards who escorted the Dalai Lama safely to India, that was the number one experience of their life. The defining moment of their entire life and service, you know, service to the Dalai Lama. Um, you know, given the depth of the faith you have in him, the devotion you have to him, you've taken him as your teacher. You know, it's something that's precious, right? So what do you do when this most precious life's experience is not known, is not valued, doesn't become history, right, by your community? How it was explained to me is that everyone understood that you couldn't talk about the history, right? We're not allowed to talk about it. The time will come when we can talk about it, and that this pivoted or it relied, you know, on the Dalai Lama. That it was potentially dangerous to tell this history now. It might harm His Holiness. We need to wait. We need to look to him for signs, you know, of what can happen. Like when maybe we'll be able to start telling this history. And I, and the more and more I had conversations with these people, I understood that it wasn't that it was going to be secret forever, but that a time would come when the history, when you could tell this history. So it was like it was, it was being postponed, it was being held. And finally I came on the, the idea of a rest, because that actually felt, um, it really fit in many ways, um, with the way that the term works in English, given that there was no Tibetan term. And that's very cultural, right? Think of all the cultural things you have that you do, that you believe in, that don't have a name. Right? So there are lots of cultural practices we have that don't have names. And if someone asks you why you do it, you just say, I don't know. Right? That's just the way we do it. Right? So it's, it's one of these sorts of things. So for a, when a, a history to be arrest, arrested means that it is, it's going to say it's insane, it's keeping maybe safe. It may be in a safe location, but the period of arrest is often one of, of being battered um, and of actually not necessarily being well kept. Right, if you think of a jail cell, if you think of a prison cell. But the idea is that a time will come right, when the history can be released and that then you will be able to tell it. Um, for me, this also fit um, the Tibetan idea of the, the terra tradition or terma. Uh, so terma are uh, treasures that are buried and they can be physical objects, you know, like a material object, like a water bottle or a book that is literally buried in the land um, by someone who is a trained, uh, a tertun, a, a treasure revealer, to be found decades, centuries in the future, or it can be something that's non-tangible, an idea that's buried somewhere um, in, in the mind of a future being that will be found in, in lifetimes in the future. So something also about the idea of terror seemed very resonant with this. And terror, of course, um, are done throughout the landscape of Khan, right? So also there was a connection to Eastern Tibet. Why arrested, though? You know, why was this so... <laughs> Before all of that, though, what was evident to me the minute I started doing this research is that people didn't know this history. Most Tibetans did not know it, and I started doing this research in the early to mid-90s. It was not known. So people from other provinces just didn't know what had happened, but even people from Kham, from the province that had, had most of the soldiers, um, Amdo also had many soldiers who were in Chishigandra. They didn't know either. Sometimes I would sit down with someone, you know, to interview them. You know, and an old man at this point, someone in their 60s, someone in their 70s, and family members would gather around and say, we've never heard these stories. And I would think, how can this be possible? Or like, how can you not know the story of the fight for your country? Right? Which is often the first story that is told, 
So why is this story not told? This is the other question I get asked a lot. Like, why is the history arrested? You know, what's the reason? So one, um, the Tibetans didn't win. I'd say that's a clear answer. And yet, if you think of all the other histories, you know there's lots of stories of the valiant effort that was made, even though, right, we failed on the battlefield. So that doesn't fully explain it. Um, two, it involved the CIA, so it was secret, right? Everything involving the CIA you know, is secret. So there were many things they were not allowed to talk about by virtue of that relationship, but that's only a small part. Um, three, when you have a politics of nonviolence, it's difficult to narrate a history of war, right? War is not nonviolent. Right, so that right there is a very big tension. And that's very uncomfortable. That's difficult to talk about, right? And when you stand before the world and say, ours is a nonviolent struggle, how do you then add in, but we fought, right? And, and not just metaphorically, not just at the UN. We fought on the battlefield, right? That's a difficult story to tell. So Buddhism does make uh, an allowance, right, for fighting when the Dharma is under threat, right? So there are you know, various, not fully loopholes, um, but ways to defend yourself that are encoded, right, within scripture, within practice. But what I can tell you is that all of the soldiers I knew, you know, who were veterans when I knew them, spent the rest of their life atoning for any of the violences they had committed on the battlefield. Um, men who had been laymen before, many of them became monks, right, to try and purify um, the violences that, that they had committed. Men who had been monks before who had unrobed or disrobed to serve in the army, you're not allowed to put those robes back on once you've taken them off, because um, now you've broken your vows. But they were some of the most devout um, religious, spiritual, um, highest people I've ever known in my entire life. Not some of them. They were the most devout people. All right. So there's three reasons, but there's a fourth, right? And the fourth, I think, is the one, <laughs> the one why this history still remains um, not fully released. And it's about internal politics. It's about the politics of community, right? What does it mean to be a community? So those regions of Tibet, um, we say, right, like, right? Tibet is three regions, three main regions. And in some ways, those are fighting words. They're not just a factual statement, right? So where you are from um, means a lot, right? It's part of your identity. It's part of your history. It's where your family's from. It might be how you tie your belt. It might be the specific dialect you speak or how you fold your momos or make your bread, right? Or, or eat your sampa. Um, it's, it's who your deities are and who your rinpoches were. It's, it's a deep core part of your being. Coming into exile, and even in the moment of fighting, that had to be about unification, about coming together all as Tibetans, rather than saying, well, I'm a Kampa, and you're an Amdawa, and you're, I don't know, from Shikatse, or you're Ngari. <laughs> um, and the way that this unfolded in the Tibetan community, and continues to unfold, um, was as a tension that, that's been really painful which is that to be unified has meant there hasn't been space to also be, have a regional identity that's meaningful to you, that's not threatening. And the community to this day, um, in many places, not in all, has a hard time um, allowing it to be and, right? Tibetan and Kampa, versus um, having to choose one or the other as your primary. And that is really at the heart I think of why the history is arrested, because it puts, um, it brings to the surface something that feels dangerous and that divides the community rather than brings it together. It's 1970s, right? Mm -hmm. the Nixon went to China, and Kissinger went to China, and the, after that, like, there's like lots of changes uh, within the, uh, uh, the politics, and also the, there's lots of changes in the, uh, like to Chicago mm -hmm. and also at the same time the Nepalese government also like the change into talk more about these things like the politics of this like US politics, CIA and Nepalese government, all these things. How the sure. things happen. 
So there are three main governments involved. Um, in negotiating both with Chushigandru and with the Tibetan government. And I kind of want to make the point that they were operating not as equals, but um, as two units working together. And so Andrew Gompatashi, again, considered the founder of the Chushigandru army. From the Tibetan government side, we had Jalutundu, who is um, one of the Dalai Lama's brothers. And so he was sort of the official, unofficial um, emissary from the Tibetan government to the US government. Also himself a controversial figure. I think it's important to say that out loud. <laughs> so the other governments um, were India, Nepal, right, and the United States. Okay, so the United States, because of their anti-communist right politics, and again, this is the Cold War, right? So this is during the Cold War, like the height of the Cold War, um, of course, wants to support Chushigandru because they're fighting against the communists. Unlike most CIA operations, where the CIA goes in and would create a body to agitate against the, the ruling power, um, Chushigandru created themselves, right? Like this was a homegrown citizens initiative. This was a citizens army. And so for the CIA officers who worked on this Tibetan mission, it was unlike any other they ever participated in the rest of their careers. Again and again, CIA officers told me that. Like the Tibet operation was special, it was different. Right, they had like this mutual respect for each other that just um, was mostly unprecedented in their other relations. India and Nepal um, basically were in some ways in a position, especially Nepal, um, to have to do what the US asked. So what the CIA did is first they trained those initial soldiers, the bodyguards and the telegraph operators in, uh, on the island of Saipan, uh, which was a bit of a US semi-colony at the time. So they were trained there. They quickly realized that a tropical island was not an appropriate place to train Tibetans from like you know, the high plateau. Then they started training Tibetans in Virginia, um, which is also a uh, sea level humid climate. They realized that was also not appropriate for training Tibetan soldiers. And so they ended up moving the entire operation to Colorado, which is the state where I live, which has a high altitude training camp that had existed, that had been built in World War II for training ski paratroopers to fight against the Nazis in Europe, you know, basically in Italy and Austria. And so it was called Camp Hale. And its elevation is roughly, I think, around, I would say around 11,000 um, feet. So up pretty high for the United States. It was the closest they could get in the continental US to approximating a Tibetan landscape, right? High elevation mountains. Um, and it was somewhat isolated. And so they created a secret camp. This was in 1958, right? Where this earlier, this World War II training camp had been. So for six years, from 1958 through 1964, the CIA trained several hundred Tibetan soldiers there. Right. They also, however, got the Nepali government and the king of Mustang, the Lojebo, right, to agree to establish a Chushigandru camp in Mustang, uh, Tibetan Lo, which is a small kingdom in Nepal that sticks up into Tibet. Right. So that was the military headquarters. The office headquarters was in Darjeeling. And Darjeeling and Kalimpong, these were the places where Tibetans could come out. Like the Natu La was there, so coming out of Tibet, that was a, a, the traditional uh, trade route. So it was a place, it was, these were Tibetan places where Tibetans uh, from in Tibet had lived for a long time and knew well. All right. So we have the trading camp in Colorado, we have the military camp in Nepal, we have the office basically in Darjeeling, and then the Indian government initially agrees to create a Tibetan battalion. Um, Unit 22 or Establishment 22 was formed. So this was kind of the Chushigandru like uh, sibling, cousin brother organization, right, in the Indian military. And then later the Special Frontier Force. So there are two Tibetan forces, one under the Ministry of Home and one under the army. Um, Histories of those also remain somewhat arrested, but that's, that's a, a related but somewhat different story. Uh, so the training camp in Colorado ended in 1964. The military camp in Mustang in Nepal continued on for another decade after that, until we got to the point where Nixon and the United States, where Norm, President Nixon were normalizing relations with China, things were changing. Um, the Tibetans were not winning 
Uh, what they were being successful at was um, collecting intelligence from China. So the number one um, intelligence hall that the US government had during the entire Cold War in relation to China was, was a leather satchel of documents that Chu Shigandru soldiers captured. Like the number one thing. Like all of the other CIA spies, nothing even added up to that. Uh, however, the operation just really wasn't accomplishing the sort of goals that it needed to accomplish, right? They were sort of being a gadfly or a, a thorn in the side of China. Um, so that uh, also Nepal was not incredibly happy uh, having the army there. And so eventually um, it was shut down, again, not without controversy and, um, and death, actually. So the Nepali government tried to shut down the army and the Tibetans had no interest in listening to the Nepalis. So His Holiness the Dalai Lama finally had to send an emissary who had a message from, himself, from the Dalai Lama himself. And it was only upon hearing the message from the Dalai Lama right, that the Tibetan soldiers agreed to finally, right, stop operations. However, even that wasn't enough. A number um, peacefully basically surrendered their, rep their weapons and went with the government of Nepal to be resettled in Nepal. Um, some very sadly committed suicide. Others tried to escape and the Nepali army pursued them and a number of Tibetans were killed. By the it's, it's a very, very sad um, end to that particular chapter. Yeah. So when you go back to the field work, mm -hmm. right? So you're talking lots about like Baba Lexi and you're uh -huh. also talking about lots of things like the memories and belongings. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about what is the memories or what are the belongings and what is the missing in that between? Yeah, so I used to call this research the project of many grandfathers because when I started it I was, was I was very young, I was 24 years old, I think when I started this research, and I was spending all of my time with men between the ages of 60 and 90. So it was, you know, young Carol and all of these old men who, who, who saw me as like a daughter, granddaughter figure. And, and they were lovely and they had so many stories to tell. And again, many of them hadn't told the stories to anyone. Um, you know, to their families, to their friends. And in telling them, a lot came up, including um, borrowing from the anthropologist Vina Das, um, the phrase, the pains of belonging. So sometimes we think that um, the most painful element of, of a relationship is to not belong, right? To try to fit in, but you don't fit in. And instead, what I learned from these men, these veterans, was that often, the greater, greater pain is in the compromises you make, right, to belong. Um, so these veterans basically had to give their consent to not tell their story, right, for their history to be arrested, to remain at the level of memory, right, something they knew but didn't speak of, or maybe just personal stories shared among friends. You know, like when you went for Clora at Boda, um, Boda, uh, um, large, massive, right, Tibetan Buddhist um, a stupa, a temple of Chorten in, in Kathmandu that you walk around um, multiple times each day as a form of kora or walking meditation. And sometimes you do that alone, praying while you do it with prayer beads. Other times you do it while you're walking with friends. And often when I was at kora, I would come up and it would be, you know, three of the veterans walking together, right? You know, just kind of the, what does it mean to to be in that space together where you, you know each other's stories? You don't have to say them, right? But you share memories, including the knowledge, right, that to everyone else you're just anonymous. You're not war veterans walking around, right? On June 16th, on the founding day of Chushigandru, no one is, is fetting you or celebrating you or commemorating, right, your actions or your sacrifices. So I was interested in... And again, it was the 90s. This was very current in anthropology at the time, the relationship between history and memory, right? Why do we connect those two? How, how do they work together? Um, in what way does memory um, maybe stand in for history when histories can't be told? And what's the, what's the shape and the form of memory um, in relationship to, to history? Um, also in terms of the truth claims and the status, right, that's given to these. So again, the men um, who were sharing their stories with me were very aware that the history was not, was arrested, but the, the arrest of the history 
was also felt to them somewhat punitive, right? Or, or something that was, um, that there was an element of something negative, something bad associated with it, right? And so that they had to tread very carefully, right, in telling the story. Um, not trying to be unclear, there, there's so much, that there was a lot of politics happening at the time. And many people had to work very carefully to try and navigate and negotiate you know, their own relationship to things that were happening in 1994. A group of, of Chushigadru veterans signed an agreement with the Mongolian and Tibetan Affairs Commission of Taiwan. They said they did it um, in the name of His Holiness to try and ease the way for him to return to Tibet should the ROC um, be the ones who end up being in charge of Tibet. His Holiness was not happy you know, at all and had not known in advance. You know, and this caused a great split among the veterans. Right? So just these pains of community. Um, um, when history is held in abeyance, when history is arrested, right, when things aren't known, what fills that space? Right? Absences are always filled you know, with something. And often it's, it's some form of fear. A new uh, commercial, co commercial mm -hmm. like the film, like Holy Wars and Six Rangers is coming very soon. Mm -hmm. And like recently, they, they also they, there are lots of other like documents, uh, yeah. the books, and also coming. Like, do you think that like the arrested history of the uh, Tibet is uh, still under the arrest, or is like coming out? Is a mm -hmm. time to do right. Yeah, my research, which is now thirty years ago, so three decades. You know, a long time. Uh, the soldiers, the veterans, felt that the time to tell the histories had come, and many of them overtly discussed that with me. You know, I, it's even in there. I think verbatim, the time for telling history has come. You know, someone said that to me. The time for telling the secrets has come. That said, <laughs> I think we're still in the period of release. You know, it's not full. So let me give you a cup. So even before this book was published, there were other books. Andrew Gompatashi published a book called Four Rivers, Six Rages Before His Death. Um, so again, the leader. You know, so, and that book was published by the library by, of Tibetan Works and Archives. Right? So that exists. However, it, it didn't give away too much because it couldn't at the time, right, when that book came out. Um, there are a couple other books that focused on the CIA, right? There are little things here and there. Uh, Jung Yun Norbu had written Warriors of Tibet, focused on Nyarong Aten's story. Nyarong Aten, again, is the one who told me I had to study history if I wanted to talk about culture and politics, right? So it wasn't that there were little things, right, coming out. Um, then my book came out, a series, a couple other, two other books came out focused on the CIA. Two CIA officers wrote books, Roger McCarthy and Ken Knauss, like from a CIA perspective. So there was a moment where it felt like lots was happening. Um, Tenzin Sonam and Rito Seren made a film, right, Shadow Circus, a documentary film that interviewed many of the veterans. That came out in the, I want to say, 95 or so, kind of mid-90s. So there was a period, and, and let me pause by saying, uh, Tenzin Sonam's father is Drongik Lamo Sering, uh, who was uh, Drongik's secretary to Jalatundu, right? So someone who himself had been involved in the resistance and, and deeply involved, like front row, front row seat. After I did my research, the next thing that really seemed to happen, because all of this that I'm talking about was all in English, all of a sudden a bunch of Tibetan language books started coming out. So uh, Lamo Tserings, I mean, multiple volumes. Ratu Gawa, multiple volumes. Um, Zhang Ritsang family, uh, we, we have a book from them that I helped them edit that was originally in Tibetan, translated into English. Dewa Tsang, um, Anya Tsang just came out with a book. So lots of different families, right? People who collected, whether it was biography, autobiography, you know, family working together to produce the book. More and more have been coming out. Uh, a commercial film, you write like a fiction film is now being made based on um, the Dewa Tsang book. So, and I don't know if that's coming this year or next year, but an all Tibetan production. So super exciting. So things are happening. However, just telling the story, the existence of this book or the existence of a film isn't enough. So I, I want to give three examples of why not. So my book came out in 2010. It's been out for a while now. The day after I received it in the mail, <laughs> I received it September 9th, 2010. 
And there's a page in this book that says, if you go to Camp Hale, which is now a National Historic Site, it talks about what happened in the camp up to 1958, and then the story picks up again from 1964. So for the six years that the Tibetans were there, it said nothing, like as if nothing had happened there. The day after my book was released, we had a ceremony at Camp Hale to install a plaque <laughs> saying that from 1958 to 1964, the CIA trained Tibetan soldiers here. So my book was like, was out of date on the day it was published, basically. Right. However, who was at that ceremony? CIA veterans were there. Chushigandru veterans were there, the children of both of those groups, um, others from the local Tibetan community were there, some reporters from VOA and RFA were there, and I was there, right, like the scholar. Who was not there? And, and actually, and Senator Mark Udall, so one of the two Colorado senators, so a major US politician was there. There was no one there from the Dalai Lama's government. So that absence, the fact that no one had come, not from Dharamsala, but from New York or, or from DC. That showed that the history in some ways was still arrested. Right? The fact that there was no one there from the government. Okay. A couple years after this book came out, I was giving a talk about it at Harvard, and a young man came up to me and said, you know, Professor Carroll, I'm halfway through your book, and this is amazing, and I'm also um, a spoken word and hip-hop artist. He was a rapper. And he said, I want to make a uh, rap song from this book. And so he did. Um, his name's Olo. It's on YouTube, if you want to see this a while ago now. But he went beyond that. So there's a, there is a rap version like it's called Four Rivers, Six Ranges, like a Chushigandru rap that you can find that's phenomenal that he did. But then he went beyond that. And he organized what is, to my knowledge, the first ever June 16th program to an educational program, but also a commemorative program about Chushigandru for the Tibetan community that was not a Kampa program. Right? It was in Boston, and it was just for the Tibetan community there, where they said, we are going to bring the community together, it doesn't matter which region you're from, to learn about this history right? and to honor right, the people who participated in it. So there's the two things. The third thing is that the Tibetans, so most of the men who participated in this have not passed away. Right? There's not very many of, of, of them left. But what they are most looking for, um, and what they are starting to get, right? It, it, any of us in this room, Tibetan or non-Tibetan, our appreciation matters, especially those of you in this room who are Tibetan, your appreciation, your acknowledgement of their story matters. But it's really about the relationship to His Holiness, right, to the Dalai Lama. And actually, I wanted the subtitle of this book to be Tibet, the Dalai Lama, and Memories of a Forgotten War. Instead, the subtitle is Tibet, the CIA, and Memories of a Forgotten War. And I said to my publisher, to my editor, I said, the Dalai Lama is more important than the CIA. And he said, well, Tibet and the Dalai Lama, in, in the world of publishing, kind of cancel each other, not cancel each other up, this is the same thing. And the CIA will draw people to the book in an important way. But really, this book is about the relationship people have to the Dalai Lama. And what it means to, to honor that relationship while hoping that something different is possible, right? That you can tell this story, um, not just tell this story before you die, but that you can perhaps die in a free Tibet. And that the work that you did toward that goal, right, um, counted and is acknowledged and is appreciated. <clears throat> nearly 13, 14 years mm -hmm. after you published this book, the yeah. United States uh, mm -hmm. supported the Tibetan government, mm -hmm. especially uh, for the progress of democracy, welfare, and all these things. Uh, state and Western countries, their support for the CIA and Tibet wars, and then they moved to, shift, shift to, to the non warnings and all these things. Now, coming back to, to the Tibet, to the, like, the state level implementing mm -hmm. laws and all these things. Yeah. Like, what do you feel like the progress or I think U.S. assistance and support for Tibet is insufficient. And I'm not a British citizen, but I would say the same, you know, for the U.K. as well. Um, 
the UK was one of the only countries in the world that had uh, treaties and relationships with an uh, independent Tibet, and they have not held up their end of the, um, you know, the relationship at all. But I will not only blame the British, I will also blame my own country, um, which has acted mostly in its own interest, which is basically what diplomacy is, trying to get, advocate for your own interest um, and meet somewhere in the middle. But the middle, um, there's only a middle when you have an adversary who is of equal status. So um, the United States is, it does do some work, and there are many um, individuals, just ordinary people, activists, citizens, as well as elected politicians who truly work hard on behalf of Tibet. Um, now that there are many Tibetans resident in the United States as citizens, and, and not as many here in the UK, um, but also Tibetans who are citizens, right? Um, with citizenship, then you can also advocate for yourself vis-a-vis -vis elected officials, right? Um, or become an elected official yourself, which is something now we see, you know, there are Tibetan elected officials in the United States and Switzerland and Canada, um, making a true distance, uh, sorry, difference from that position, right? Not just lobbying officials, but becoming, <laughs> right, a, a government official. Um, some of the things that the United States has done that I think have been good, so for example, the United States has put into law that um, the succession of the current Dalai Lama, that the next Dalai Lama, the process of, of finding and naming who that individual will be, is something that is the um, in the power of only the Dalai Lama himself, right? That that is something that goes to the Tibetan community, but specifically to the Dalai Lama. And why that is important is because geopolitically, China tries to claim that, right? That only, and, and the irony is, is large, only the Chinese Communist Party can name the next Buddhist reincarnation of the Dalai Lama. Um, again, farce. But to the PRC, very, very serious, and that's what they say to the world. Right. So the fact that the United States at least makes, puts on paper um, statements like that, and yet standing up to China in a way that would truly enable um, what Tibetans need and want feels not fully possible in today's world. Imagine, do you think all those information are in the public information now, or are they still, do you think there's still some right. information that are? So you can request um, documents through a, we call it a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act in the United States. However, when you request documents from the CIA, they come to you heavily redacted. And what that means, if I could just this way, is that you get the paper and you see everything is blacked out. So you can see that a sentence is there, but you can't see what it says. And I actually, I have an article coming out this year on redaction that centers on a story um, told to me by Ken Canau. So he was one of the retired CIA officers who wrote a book. And he wrote a book called Orphans of the Cold War about Tibet. And because he was retired, he had to request his own files. Like formally, he had to put in a FOIA request for his own documents. <laughs> And documents that he wrote, right? he is the one who had written the report or the letter, came to him redacted. Mm -hmm. right, so he wasn't even allowed to see his own records. So those records exist, but we don't have access to them. Um, it's similar, um, if you go to India, for example, um, many documents relating to Tibet are also not um, visible. Um, some of those same documents, if I go here to the India office um, library in the British Library, I can see them here. And then if I go to Delhi, I can't see the, the documents I looked at yesterday in London, I can't see tomorrow in Delhi because they have anything related to the border. The border of um, India and Tibet is militarized, right, are closed to scholars. So the access to documents is something that's incredibly difficult. Um, Tibetan documents, of course, are also hard to find. So any Tibetan government documents that, and those were left behind, those weren't brought out into exile when they escaped. Um, if they still exist, you know, and weren't destroyed by the Chinese, I, someone like me, I don't have access to those. Some scholars inside might, and there is some writing about Chushi Gandru um, by scholars inside Tibet. Outside, 
um, Shushigandru veterans collected battalion histories. So they have tons of written records and for decades have talked about um, publishing those, but it's never happened. And I don't know the status, um, I'm sure someone does, I just at the moment don't know the status of all of those very painstakingly written, um, handwritten documents that different battalions kept about um, their members, battles they fought, um, you know, pay scale that the soldiers got, or, uh, you know, the punishments meted out for various things. You know, it was a real army, right, with real rules and real regulations. Um, and so those are, uh, they were in Majda Katila for a long time, I don't know, um, between Majda Katila and, and Dharamsala, where all of the documents for Chushigandra themselves are kept at the moment. But that's also another source um, that exists. And then, so can you talk more about your current project to lead the debate? I have several going on. Um, the further on you get in your career, the more you have projects kind of overlapping. Um, I still remain a you know, scholar of Chushigandru, so we just uh, found the camp. So in 2010, when we had the ceremony there, uh, again, there were both CIA veterans and Chushigandru veterans there, and they went off to, to see if they could find where the camp had actually been. So it's a very large site. Um, and they couldn't pinpoint the exact location, which was a huge disappointment, right? So we were just at the site in general. At the time, the camp had had a big wall around it, and the access road was different than it currently is. So I think there was also, in addition to being, you know, 50 years later, um, there was also some disor disorientation in terms of the you know, geographic um, location. We just found it last month. Um, and so we're having a ceremony this summer on June 9th to mark the act and commemorate the actual location. Um, and the, uh, our local, the Colorado Chushigandru, is hoping to get permission to build a stupa or a chorten on the site. But we have to work with the National um, Park Service to see if that's possible. The other projects I'm working on, I've been working for the for a long time now on citizenship, um, on refusal, on theoretical storytelling. So I'm, I'm finishing up a book on that right now. I also, for many decades, have been researching and writing about the Pontesong family, so a Kampa trading family who, in the span of one generation, went from regionally important traders to the richest family in all of Tibet. However, then fell. Um, fell just as sharply as they had risen due to um, a fight that the patriarch had with Jalatundup, with the Dalai Lama's brother, so the same man who was involved in Shushikandru. And the family suffered um, what you could call a social death. And to this day, their story is one that also remains very difficult to tell. Um, and perhaps even more controversial in some ways than a history of the CIA you know, or of nonviolence, um, because it involves writing about someone's family um, and think about just how intimate that is, right? Ethnography is intimate. Ethnography is much more intimate than history. You know, history can be, but ethnography is, is the face-to-face, -face, bringing that into it, right? This, the sitting with stories, the rhythms of everyday life, knowing the cadence of someone's voice, knowing how they like to take their tea. Um, in person, right? Not just through re reading someone's diary or reading about them. And so for me, that book, I've published six or seven articles. So they're scattered about in different places, but there's something about collecting them in a book that's been um, a bit daunting. So um, I'm also working on a major volume called The Tibet Reader. Uh, with a wonderful group with um, Dijin Pemba, who's based here in London, with Lama Jab, a professor up at Oxford, with Dondup Tashi Rekjong, who's finishing up his PhD at Northwestern in Buddhist studies, and with Nicole Willick, who's a professor of Buddhist studies in Virginia. And that is a major volume covering the early, early 20th century all the way up to the present, focused on culture, history, and politics in all primary sources. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Carol for joining the Talk podcast, and all my friends. Thank you for joining the Talk Talk podcast. This is like my first live interview in English, <laughs> but hopefully many things come. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>